Here we're going to look at two important special functions that are defined in terms of integrals. The first is the logarithmic integral function. So that's given by li of x. And notice that this l is lowercase. If it's uppercase, it's related to something called the polylogarithm, which is a related concept, although a bit different. I have a couple videos on the dilogarithm if you want to find those. So this is the integral from 0 to x of 1 over the natural log of y dy. Then next we have the exponential integral function, and that's denoted by eix, and that's the integral from minus infinity to x of e to the y over y dy. So you might say, well, why do we need to define these functions in the first place? Or maybe what's interesting about these functions in the first place? Well, the integrands here do not have elementary antiderivatives. So that means there's no simplification that can be done to this object here other than just writing it as is. In other words, we cannot write down an elementary antiderivative of 1 over the natural log of y and then evaluate it at the endpoints. Similarly for e to the y over y. Okay. So let's maybe start with this first observation, which links these two functions together. So we have ei evaluated at the natural log of x. In other words, we're composing the natural log and this exponential integral. And we, in fact, get the logarithmic integral. This actually goes pretty quickly, just via a quick substitution. But let's see it. So let's calculate ei of ln of x. So that's going to be equal to the integral from minus infinity up to the natural log of x of e to the y over y dy. Let's recall that our variable here is occurring in the bound of integration. That's why we need to put that ln of x in the bound of integration. And now we're going to perform a substitution. And it's maybe the obvious substitution, given that we'd like to turn this natural log of x into just plain old x, because we have kind of our goal written down already. So let's set y equal to the natural log of u and see what happens. So that means that dy is equal to 1 over u du, just by taking the derivative of both sides. And then u equals e to the y, which is what we get from inverting this first definition. So now let's see what happens to the bounds of integration. So as y approaches negative infinity, we see that u approaches, well, e to the minus infinity loosely, but that's zero. So we'll say u approaches zero. And it's important to see that u approaches zero from above because e to the y is always positive. Okay, then what happens at the upper bound? So if y is equal to the natural log of x, then that means that u is equal to e to the natural log of x, which is just x. So that gives us our upper bound. Now let's see what this gives us. So we've got the integral from 0 to x, so that's looking good. And then we can write e to the y as u. y was equal to the natural log of u. And then dy was 1 over u du. But notice what we've got here. We've got a u in the numerator and in the denominator. Those will cancel out, and we'll have exactly what we need in order for this to be the logarithmic integral function evaluated at x. OK, so that clears up the proof of this first observation. Now we're going to look at a nice integral involving this logarithmic integral. For our next little exploration of this logarithmic integral function, we're going to calculate the following integral, which is parametrized by a real number alpha. So let's see what we've got. For alpha and r, we want to determine the value of the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the alpha times the logarithmic integral function dx. And post in the comments what the restriction should be on alpha, because definitely not all alpha makes sense here. OK, so how could we approach this? Well, I'm going to use the internet's favorite integral trick, which is Feynman's technique of taking the derivative under the integral. So that means I'm going to set this equal to a function of alpha. So for us, I'm going to set this equal to z, which we're going to read as a function of alpha. So we've got z is a function of alpha. 
And now we can take our definition of this logarithmic integral function and put it inside of this integral. So we have z is the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to x of x to the alpha, that's this part right here, over natural log of y dy dx. So that's including this right here. Now I'll take this iterated integral and change it into a double integral. So that'll be the double integral over a region, which I'll call triangle. As we'll see, it'll be a triangular region. And then we'll have x to the alpha over natural log of y dA, where that's my differential area component. Now let's sketch out what this region triangle looks like. And then after we have that sketch, we can easily change the order of the bounds of integration. So let's notice that the x values here go between 0 and 1. So let's put 1 on the x-axis. That'll be important to have. And then the y values go between 0 and x. So that tells us that the line y equals x is probably important to have on this picture as well. So there's my line y equals x. So now filling this in, we see that our region looks something like this. So there we have x going between 0 and 1, and y goes between 0 and x. So now let's change the order of those bounds of integration and see what we have. So now we see that y can be between 0 and 1, and then the smallest x can be is the line x equals y, and the largest it can be is the line x equals 1. And I think about that by taking an arbitrary value of x here on the x-axis and seeing that the leftmost point in our region is happening at x equals y and the rightmost point in our region is happening at x equals 1. So that's how I come up with this inequality. Okay, so now that we've got this set up, we can easily change this double integral back to an iterated integral in the other order. So that'll be the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from y to 1 of x to the alpha over natural log of y, and then we have dx dy. And the advantage of doing it in that order is the antiderivative with respect to x is easy. So let's take that antiderivative with respect to x. That'll give us the integral from 0 to 1. And then we'll have x to the alpha plus 1 over natural log of y evaluated at x equals 1 and x equals y dy. Now taking this antiderivative will leave us with the integral from 0 to 1. And then we'll have x to the alpha plus 1 over alpha plus 1 times natural log of y. And we're evaluating that from x equals y up to x equals 1 dy. Okay, so now plugging in those endpoints will give us 1 over alpha plus 1. I'll just take that out of the integral because it's a constant multiple with respect to the variables of integration. And then we've got our integral from 0 to 1 of, let's see, 1 to the alpha plus 1, which is just 1, minus y to the alpha plus 1 over the natural log of y dy. So we've got this nice form for our function z, which is a function of alpha. Okay, so let's move that up here and then we'll keep going. Here's our new expression for our function z, which is like our goal parameterized integral over here. Now we're gonna find this value of z using differential equations. So let's take the derivative. So that'll give us z prime. And let's maybe note over here that by z prime, I mean the derivative of z with respect to alpha. I'll just write it as z prime to keep everything looking a little bit simpler. Okay, so let's see. That's gonna give us the derivative of this with respect to alpha times this plus this times the derivative of this with respect to alpha, just using the product rule here. So let's see, the derivative of one over alpha plus one with respect to alpha is minus one over alpha plus one squared. You can just use the chain rule there, maybe the quotient rule or the generalized power rule, however you wanna think about it. And then we have the integral from zero to one of one minus y to the alpha plus one over natural log of y dy. 
and then we'll have that is added to one over alpha plus one times the integral from zero to one of one minus the derivative with respect to alpha of y to the alpha plus one over natural log of y dy. So let's notice I brought my derivative with respect to alpha onto only this term because that's the only term with an alpha in it. So I wanna notice a few things before we keep going. Maybe the first of which is that this guy right here can be written in terms of our original function. That's in fact equal to minus one over alpha plus one times our original function z. And then we can use the exponential derivative rule to take the derivative of this part. So I'll just write it down here. Just this part in green turns into the natural log of y times y to the alpha plus one. Okay, so let's see what kind of simplification that gives for our building differential equation. So we've got z prime is equal to minus one over alpha plus one times z. And then we'll have that as plus one over alpha plus one, our integral from zero to one of y to the alpha plus one dy where notice a few things canceled. So I maybe wasn't as clear as I should have been right here. The derivative with respect to alpha will hit this constant and just give us zero, so that's gone. And then over here, this natural log that pops out will cancel this natural log in the denominator. So we're left with something like that. But now we can use the power rule to calculate that integral. And then we'll be left with minus one over alpha plus one times z plus one over alpha plus one times alpha plus two. Okay, nice. So let's bring that differential equation to the top. We'll rewrite it a little bit and then we'll keep going. Okay, on the last board we arrive at the following differential equation. We have z prime plus one over alpha plus one times z equals one over alpha plus one times alpha plus two. So this is known as a first order linear differential equation. And we can solve this by multiplying by something called an integrating factor, which will allow us to write this left hand side as the derivative of a single object. So what will work here? Well, in fact, what will work here is multiplying just by alpha plus one, and we'll see why. Okay, so that's gonna give us alpha plus one times z prime plus z equals one over alpha plus two, like that. But now let's notice a couple of things. So let's first note that the derivative of z with respect to alpha is equal to z prime by the notational choice that we've made. And then the derivative with respect to alpha of alpha plus one is just one. So that means we can take this left-hand side and rewrite it as the derivative with respect to alpha of alpha plus one times z equals one over alpha plus two. Okay, so that's looking good because we've got the derivative of some function equals some other function, and we can easily take the antiderivative. So let's see. We take the antiderivative of both sides with respect to alpha. That will give us alpha plus one times z equals the natural log of the absolute value of alpha plus two, and then we have plus some constant. And before we solve for z, we can maybe plug in alpha equals negative one and solve for that constant. So let's let alpha turn into negative one and see what happens. That'll give us zero on this left-hand side and then the natural log of one plus a constant on the right-hand side. That means our constant is in fact zero. So we'll forget about this constant. Then we can divide by this alpha plus one and we're left with z is equal to one over alpha plus one times the natural log of the absolute value of alpha plus two. And that turns out to be the value for our parametrized integral. Now again, this will not be valid for all values of alpha and post in the comments when you think that this is valid and when it isn't. And that's a good place to stop.